all past me in a minute. I can't see them at all. There we go. <laughs> oh, that's so odd. There's a nice little bug for you. Everyone, welcome back to the channel Untitled Projects. Thank you for clicking. We've got another fighter jet, the fourth jet to grace Microsoft Flight Simulator, called the Fiat G91. Now this kind of passed underneath my radar for a bit because it just suddenly appeared. And it's pretty nice. And I found it on simmarket.com and it's done by a company called Sim Skunk Works, which I haven't really been too familiar with. Uh, apparently there are a bunch of aircraft engineers, programmers, CAD specialists, experts in computer graphics and former real fighter pilots, both military and civilian, so I guess it's coming from a good place. So they appear to do a lot of aircraft for P3D and this seems to be their first offering for Microsoft Flight Simulator. But it is quite pricey and it comes in at 24 euros which is $28.22 pounds. So it's not that cheap, but from what I can see it seems like a pretty nice jet. Now it's very detailed and the cockpit seems to be in mostly working order. There are a couple of buttons you can't press, but so far so good. Now, like I said, there are a few other jets, three in total, fighter jets, in Microsoft Flight Simulator. One of them obviously is the MB339, which is relatively close to this type of aircraft. The other is the Eurofighter Typhoon, which caused a fair amount of controversy because, um, yeah, it was kind of weird when it came out. And then we've got the F-15, which came out very recently. And again, people weren't particularly happy. But this jet seems pretty good. And I think that's mainly because it's a subsonic jet. Now, Microsoft Flight Simulator doesn't appear to be able to cater for anything that is supersonic. So the G-91 appears to fall within those constraints. However, as we know, Microsoft Flight Simulator does have its limitations in regards to vapor trails, wing vortices, anything to do with fire, as we always say, and smoke. So what do you get for your money? You get loads of liveries, and I have to say they're pretty nice liveries, and if you're into vintage aircraft, this has got that tied down. What else do you get? You get a very, very detailed cockpit, almost so detailed that I don't understand it. It's also FPS friendly, so this is going to work well in multiplayer. There are some other planes that come out that just kill your frame rate. This is pretty good. You get three models, you get the R1, you get the R2, and eventually you're going to get the pan. This is to be added soon. And apparently almost all the systems have been modelled. Flight dynamics model close to real aircraft performance tables, weapon systems to carry and drop bombs, and it's got a drogue chute, which obviously slows you down when you land, which looks pretty good actually. And if you deploy it while you're flying, it disappears, just like in real life. But what I'm most interested in is this weapon system. Now can we drop bombs? Let's see. But obviously if we could, there'd be no explosions because that isn't modelled yet. Right, so let's get into it. We're going to do what we always do at Untitled Projects, which is history, obviously. Then we're going to get it on the ground, have a look at that cockpit, have a look at those graphics, see how she looks, then do a cold and dark taxi, and have a look at those flight dynamics. But first, let's get into the history. Now, as always, these older aircraft have quite interesting starting points. This starts in the Cold War. And just after the Second World War, the East and West were divided. In the East was the Warsaw Pact, and the West had NATO. And in NATO, there were several individuals who had aspirations for one multi-nation army equipped with the same armaments, calibers, equipment, land vehicles, and aircraft. But as we all know, this was not to be but was partially realised with the creation of the Fiat G91. It all starts at the end of the Korean War in 1953. The jet had proven its worth in combat and the Cold War was dragging on. Members of NATO recognised a need to re-equip their inventories with a suitable jet-powered fighter that could be used by all. So in 1953, NATO organised the NBMR1 competition. The competition was intended to produce an aircraft that was light, small, expendable, equipped with basic weapons and avionics and capable of operating with minimal ground support. This was for two reasons, to get as many aircraft in the air during a nuclear threat to large air bases, many cheaper aircraft would be better dispersed and if needs be replaced quickly, 
and the second reason was to buck the trend towards building fewer, increasingly more expensive aircraft. And as the competition kicked off, many European manufacturers were invited to submit their designs. And out of all of those designs, the G91, designed by a man called Giuseppe Gabrielli, hence the G designation, showed the most promise. He also designed the Fiat G50, the Fiat G55 in World War II, strikingly similar to the ME109, and later the G80, the first Italian fighter jet. Although the Breguet BR1001 and the Dissel Mestia were pretty close in the running, but the G91 quickly developed almost a year ahead of the other two contenders, and that put them at a huge disadvantage. And on the 9th of August 1956, the first prototype G91 conducted its maiden flight at the Castelle Airfield Turin, Italy. And it quickly progressed through its intensive test flights, showing few design flaws and exceeding all expectations. And in January 1958, the Fiat G91 was officially declared the winner of the competition. Production started immediately and was partially financed by the Americans for the French, German and Italian aircraft and in addition paying in full for the Turkish aircraft. But where were the British? They weren't interested and instead decided to concentrate on the development of the Hawker Hunter. In total around 770 were built. In all Fiat constructed 174 of them and in addition 144 G91 R3 variants for West Germany including 50 that had been ordered and then cancelled by Greece and Turkey. Germany also built 294 under a licensed production agreement between the consortium of Messerschmitt, Hankel and Dornier. And so the primary operators of the G91 were the Italian Air Force, the German Air Force and the Portuguese Air Force. And it operated for an extended period of 37 years from 1958 to 1995, but only saw combat with the Portuguese Air Force against nationalist movements in African overseas territories. And there were losses, although minimal, a single G91 was destroyed in combat in Mozambique after premature detonation of its bomb load whilst doing strikes against rebel positions on the 15th of March 1973. Between 1973 and 1974, five G91s were lost, three to missiles and two to conventional ground fire. These conflicts became known as the Portuguese Colonial War and would be the first and last conflicts the G91 flew combat missions in. In the late 70s and early 90s, the G91 operated mainly as a trainer and aerobatic display aircraft. Lengthened two-seater version, the G91T1, was created for progressive fighter pilot training. In 1995, the last G91 was phased out and retired by Italy. Many examples of the G91 survive in museums today across Europe and further afield, so getting close to one isn't too hard if you really look. And from what I've read, there are no airworthy versions left although there is a supposed restoration project in Germany currently ongoing. Right, we're back down on the ground, and we are at Caselle Airfield, which is in Turin, Italy. And this is, obviously, if you listen to the history part, where this aircraft came from, or where the initial prototype took its first flight. So, yeah, pretty nice, northern Italy. Uh, if you take off, you can go straight into the mountains up there and do some low-level craziness. Um, yeah, pretty nice. Anyway, let's get into it, have a look at the plane, check out some of the systems, have a look at that cockpit, take it for a flight, and we'll go from there. So first things first, what does it look like? So, I think it's pretty good. It's pretty detailed. It's got the most writing I've ever seen on any plane and I think it's pretty spot on from all the aircraft that I've looked, from all the Wikipedia-ing Wikipedia that I've done. <laughs> Sorry. This seems pretty good. Uh, the detail's pretty close, I would say. Um, even down to whatever these things are. I mean, it looks pretty awesome. Uh, there's a couple of different versions, and some of them have got a kind of matte body and then a shiny nose, which is kind of a nice visual but um there are the guns very nice you can also put weapons on this which is pretty good and i'll show you how to do that in a minute uh it involves using a little program that comes with the aircraft uh but let's jump into the cockpit first and i'll take you through a couple of bits on a side note the pilot doesn't move he doesn't animate 
sometimes his visor is back and you just see dark eyes. So I don't know whether he's haunted or not. But uh, you'll see there's a couple of little bugs with this aircraft. So, so in the cockpit, the first thing you'll notice is that we have a tinted window up in the front here, which is pretty good when you're trying to aim. Uh, in general, uh, graphical-wise, it's not bad, I don't think. Uh, it looks pretty good. Uh, there's a couple of kind of weird graphical bits that go on. You can see that there's a little bit of flickering here. Um, there's a nice bit of distress, as I always like in these vintage aircraft. That's true to life, because it is old, you know. Um, and, yeah, there's a couple of little weird textures going on that you can see they've been stretched. Um, but apart from that, it's not too bad. I would say there's a little bit of work to be done. I think, keep in mind, this is a very, very complex cockpit with a lot of elements in it. And they've tried to make it FPS friendly, so I'm assuming they've dropped some of the graphics just a little to allow that to happen, so you're not flying on 10 frames a second. So, apart from that, I think it's pretty good. Now, some of these dials are just not very familiar to me at all, even though they do the same job as their counterparts in much simpler aircraft. Even the MB339 has a slightly different look to it. But to start with, obviously, you have your airspeed indicator here. Now, this is actually quite hard to read if you're not used to it um, because it's all abbreviated and then it's got max inside. So quite interesting once you get going, uh, just get used to it. And you can obviously set your index and everything, which is always good to do. There's your heading, classic. You can set most of these, I think. So you get PHI mode selector, and that's actually it. So you can't set most of them. You can just set one bit. Uh, here's your altitude, basic. Your turn. Uh, I don't know why it says four minute turn there. That's interesting. Um, this is nose up, nose down. So that's going to be your trim. Always got the clock in the same place. Um, your rate of climb. And this climbs pretty well at 4,000 feet a minute in full bore, so that's very nice. Uh, your artificial horizon and some other little bits that I'm not too familiar with in here. Uh, here's your fuel gauge and your pressure, uh, and this is for both engines here. So, and your voltmeter and everything. So I've had to go through this quite a few times and have a look and figure it out because it is a bit different to what I'm used to. Nice thing is we've got a drag chute here, but the drag chute kind of disappears, so you can initiate it, it does suddenly slow you down when you're on the runway, but it does disappear immediately. I don't know whether that is a bug or whether it is to do with Microsoft Flight Simulator native dynamics and the fact that that is not going to work the way that it should. Uh, we can't do anything with this. You can do your gun sight, which is cool, but I've got to turn the aircraft on before I do that. You can't obviously use your gun sight to shoot things, but you can carry bombs and you can drop bombs. All not particularly good at the moment. Uh, and here's your parking brake, essentially. So, quick cold and dark. From what I've learned in this aircraft, it looks complicated to start with, but it's actually pretty simple. You're just going to be using sections like this, which are all your power. And the, here's your starter area. Here's your canopy. Oh, actually, let's go to canopy because you can't open the canopy unless you have the electrics on. And you can see that some of these animations aren't quite there yet. So, just in terms of the aircraft and animations and the way things work. Still got a little way to go, I think, to be totally smooth. But that's just the way it is. So you can uh, <laughs> obviously jettison your canopy here as well. Uh, that doesn't work. Uh, like I said, I think only about 50-60% of these buttons actually work. Um, I don't think you need that many of them to actually operate the aircraft. And you'll see when we do the cold and dark. So, going on to cold and dark, pretty easy really. There we go. Battery switch, generator, inverters. You can test your circuit, fire, very nice, your master alarm is working. And then we can start to dial up some of the brightness of these consoles, so that's useful. Get our lights on, anti-collision, flasher, and instrument lights, which is just always very useful because it just makes everything look proper lush and then once we've got all of this on here let's get our tanks on as well and our elevator servo i don't know whether we need that or not but i've just been turning it on let's get our taxi lights on because we are going to taxi now we can open our canopy because this is red so if you do that you can't so canopy now opens you'll notice that there's absolutely no sounds 
connected to any of these things, which is kind of frustrating because it's always very nice when you turn the battery on and uh, get the alternators on, you can actually hear things whirling up, but you can't in this aircraft at all until you actually start. So let's close that canopy, which you have to hold. There we go. And then lock it. All good. And then jet pipe limiter, HE ignition, fuel booster, and I think we want to do our fuel shot off guard as well. And this should start the aircraft. So everything should initiate your artificial horizon, should gradually go into place. Uh, again, there's some weird little animations going on that aren't quite there, but hopefully there'll be an update in the future for that. And that's how you get a cold and dark. So I'm going to taxi down to the end of the runway and take it off. And uh, we shall see how she performs. Right at the runway, ready to take off. So first things first, I'm just going to dial in that gun sight because I forgot to do it earlier. Not that we need it. There we go. That light goes up and you can adjust its angle here. Not that you need that at all. Um, another quick one is how do you add bombs? So I'll show you. So you want to head back to your filing system and look in your community folder here and head to Skunkworks, go to Docs, sorry, Data, and you want to initiate this program here called G91 Setup. And it comes up with a little modal like this. And this will allow you to load this aircraft with pretty much anything you want. I'm going to go for the uh, the two 500 pounders and then you apply it. And there we go. They've ended up on your aircraft. And the way you drop them is you need to go to your controls. So head over to your controls and type in water into search and you'll come up with something called toggle water rudder. And I've just assigned a joystick button to this number three up here for dropping those bombs. Otherwise, you won't be able to drop them, but they don't really do anything anyway. They leave a kind of weird crater. No explosion. Sometimes they drop from above you. Sometimes they drop below you and don't animate properly. Microsoft Flight Simulator is not ready for bombs, clearly. Anyway, let's get rolling. So sounds are okay. Airspeed takes a while to get alive. So if you're looking at your airspeed indicator down there, it's not really giving you a particularly good idea of how fast you need to go to rotate. And I still haven't really figured this out. I think it's around 120 or so, maybe about, about 130. So we should be able to rotate about now, which we can, which is good. Right, so we're at a comfortable climb now, heading uh, just past 7,000 feet. You can see we do gain altitude pretty quickly with this. In fact, we are getting close to uh, 6,000 feet a minute, which is pretty much its maximum climb rate. So not too bad at all. But let's have a look at some of these flight dynamics. So it's quite a skittish aircraft, as in it seems to be almost too maneuverable. You can see that that seems to spin very, very quickly. Now, I don't know whether that's a realistic thing or not, because I've never flown this jet before, uh, apart from doing research for this video. So it just seems to be extremely maneuverable. Right, climbing well. I'm just going to drop those bombs, see what they do, because they're just kind of weird. But let's check it out. Oh, actually, I have to arm them. So... Let's just get this onto autopilot. There we go. Autopilot. Now we have to arm the bombs. So we have to go to bomb switch guard. That's it. Armed. Let's drop them. See what I mean? So strange. They're probably going to fall past me in a minute. I can't see them at all. There we go. <laughs> oh, so odd. There's a nice little bug for you. And those bombs, as you can see, as they disappear through the clouds there, they're just going to leave some weird little craters which aren't even worth looking at. So, apart from that, nice little thing to have, I guess. Uh, obviously, Microsoft Flight Simulator is not modelled for that yet. So, what else 
uh, is there in terms of bugs. There's a couple of weird little things going on. Uh, if you spawn in the air at about 25,000 feet, you'll find that your ailerons are stuck at their most extreme left or right-hand turn points. So that makes the plane flutter all over the place. Uh, I have experienced a couple of really, really strange uh, aerodynamic stalls where I, yeah, just fall down to the ground, upside down like a leaf. So, very strange. I think there's a lot of work to be done on this aircraft. Apart from that, it's pretty unique and I think it looks pretty nice. I like it as an addition to Microsoft Flight Simulator for me because I'm really into these types of jets. I think I prefer the MB339 a little bit more, but this is just really nice to look at and it's got that Cold War look to it. So that's it, I guess. And as always, if you like the content, drop a little subscribe or like, or if you didn't like it, it's up to you, dislike it. That is what democracy is all about. And otherwise, I guess, have a great day and hopefully see you for the next video. Okay.